I'm Shane White, and this is The Process. Hey gang, Shane White here with another edition of The Rare Book Tour. When I started pursuing oil painting in earnest back in 1998, my first painting instructor, Henry Stinson, introduced me to Russian Impressionism, sometimes known as Russian Realism. His teacher, Ron Lucas, who's since gone on to work in animated features, studied from Sergei Bongart for several years. Having that bloodline in my own background still gives me shivers every time I see Sergei's work. But what's even more fascinating is Mary Balcom's telling of Sergei's journey to America and how this colorful maestro in both palette and temperament would virtually go unnoticed by the general populace while still having a dedicated following along the way. For as little as can be found about his work, here's a brief and intelligent write-up by curator and art historian Jeffrey Morsberg from his Artists of Russia blog. Sergei Bongart was one of the most dynamic painters and colorful characters in the history of post-war California art. He was a charismatic, even flamboyant man who spoke passionately, delivering his lines with a thick Russian accent. To women, he was a romantic figure who filled the role of the cultured, old-world bohemian to the hilt. As for his art, Bongart's expressive style, he was known for his colorful palette and bold bravura brushwork, defies easy categorization. While the artist himself wasn't given to describing his work with isms or the writing of manifestos, his paintings were the synthesis of the traditional academic training that he received in the Ukraine and Europe, the influence of what has come to be known as Russian Impressionism, and his own unique artistic voice. Bongart worked in pen and ink, oil, watercolor, and acrylic, masterfully exploiting each medium for its unique qualities. The artist was famous for his a la prima approach, whereby he painted wet on wet with only the most minimal of preparatory steps. Bongart was also a legendary teacher whose students are now some of the most respected contemporary landscape and figurative painters. He was a master of the demonstration of painting before an audience, and art organizations always clamored for the opportunity to have him paint in front of their members. Sergei Bongart was born in Zukovki, a village near the Ukrainian capital of Kiev during the last stages of World War I and on the cusp of the Russian Revolution. He was fortunate to grow up in Kiev, one of the world's most beautiful cities, and to come from a sophisticated and successful family. His father, Roman Ivanovich Bongart, was a poet, athlete, and horseman, and his mother, Anna Ivanovna Bongart, was as highly cultured as she was striking. Together, they opened their son's eyes to beauty and learning. Bongart was a precocious child with a keen intellect, but like many gifted boys, he had a difficult time adjusting to the regimentation of formal education. The October Revolution and the repressive policies of Soviet dictators Vladimir Lenin and then Joseph Stalin indelibly stained the life of every citizen of the Soviet Union and its republics, especially those who were wealthy or those who possessed an independent mind or spirit. As Stalin collectivized the Ukraine, the breadbasket of Russia, the resistance of the peasant farmers to communism resulted in Stalin's unique form of retribution, a forced famine that killed millions, sent hundreds of thousands to labor camps, and eventually brought the proud Ukrainians to heel. In 1933, during this man-made Ukrainian tragedy, Bongart's mother, Anna, died of typhus. However, even during the most trying of times, man tries to create a semblance of normality, so Bongart's youthful artistic talent was still noticed. Through his father's efforts, the reluctant student first began his artistic studies with a wonderful art painter named Mikhail Mikhailievich Yarovy, a student of Repin who gave the young artist a thorough grounding in drawing and the traditions of Russian art. Not long after Bongart began his studies, the artist's father, Roman, was denounced and arrested by the KGB and ended up in one of the infamous Siberian gulags. His health broken, the elder Bongart died soon after he was allowed to return home to Kiev. Sergei Bongart saw what the Soviet regime did to his family and to millions like them, and so he remained a bitter opponent of Stalin and his political successors for the rest of his life. Because of this, the young Bongart was able to win a spot at the Kiev Art Institute while still in his teens, studying with Pyotr Ivanovich Kotov, who had been a student of Nikolai Fechin before he fled to the West. 
In spite of his resistance to doing paintings that glorified the Soviet regime, Baumgart's rise was rapid, and by the time he was 20, he had already had his work accepted for museum exhibitions. Unfortunately, the final years of young Baumgart's art education was interrupted by Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, followed by the brutal Nazi subjugation of the Ukraine. Because of the Soviet Union's murderous policies of the 1930s, the Germans were often treated as liberators when they first invaded the Ukraine, but as their mistreatment of the population increased and the reprisals for the resistance of the partisans became more savage, most Ukrainians turned against the invaders. Bongart lived in the terrible twilight where people had to choose between the murderous racial ideology of Hitler and Stalin's unstinting paranoia and class hatred. Millions of Ukrainians died during the four-year struggle between fascism and communism perishing from combat, spontaneous executions, starvation, disease, or from the brutal conditions in Soviet labor camps or German death camps. In the midst of this maelstrom of war, Baumgart was married briefly. The story of his life during the war remained sketchy by design as the community of Soviet emigres had more than its share of intrigues. Somehow, in the middle of the epic and bestial war between the Nazi Wehrmacht and the Red Army, Baumgart managed to escape the Soviet Union and make his way to Europe narrowly avoiding the forced repatriation that many Soviet citizens suffered due to agreements between the Allies and Stalin's regime. He traded sketches for necessities and eventually found some old friends from Kiev who had also managed to escape to the West. Bongard and these opponents of the Stalin regime lived a life of intrigue among the Russian emigre communities as the Iron Curtain fell across Europe. After the war, he painted portraits and continued his studies in Prague, Vienna, and Munich, waiting desperately for the opportunity to emigrate to the United States, where he hoped his life could take on some sense of normalcy. Bongard finally received his visa, allowing him to come to the United States in 1948. He initially settled in Memphis, Tennessee, where again he turned to formal portraits as a means of support. There he began to build a following, even though the area didn't have a vibrant art scene. Bongart came to Los Angeles in 1954 with the intention of painting Western scenes. Instead, he built a following for his still lifes, landscapes, and genre scenes. Bongart's early works tended to use a more limited palette, but his colors were always rich and the technique bold and confident. Recognizing that there was a lack of classical training available to American students, Bongart opened his first teaching atelier in the MacArthur Park neighborhood, where a number of art schools were located soon after his arrival in the Southland. In a matter of months, his studio was a beehive of activity. In 1964, he purchased Nikolai Fetchin's old studio in the beachside neighborhood of Rustic Canyon, still in Los Angeles, but adjacent to Santa Monica. The studio had been built in 1930 and was used for many years by husband and wife sculptors Holger Jensen and Helen Jensen before Fetchin acquired it and used it for painting and teaching, so it had a long artistic tradition. The Lower Rustic Canyon neighborhood was an inspired choice for Bongart, and he painted, demonstrated, and taught for the last 20 years of his life among the eucalyptus, sycamore, oaks, and sequoias that populate the Bohemian Paradise located just a short walk from the coast. As the years went on, Bongart became a legendary teacher. He was responsible for transmitting his traditional artistic values and his way of looking at art and life to generations of students. His studio became a haven for artists who wanted the type of traditional art education that had all but disappeared from larger institutions. His students did not want the do-your-own-thing artistic ethos of the 1960s and 1970s, but real instruction from a teacher who could actually paint. Bongart was a generous teacher, but he could be an acerbic critic, and studying with him often required a thick skin. His classes included amateur painters for whom painting was a pastime, as well as serious artists with advanced degrees but who had lacked critical instruction. Bongart chose the most promising prospects as scholarship students, and they paid for their instruction by assisting with classes and workshops and performing tasks for their teacher. Today, a number of Bongart's scholarship students are prominent artists and teachers in their own right, including Sonny Pichapong-Yang, Dan Pinkham, Ron Lucas, Dan McCaw, Joseph Mendez, and Del Gish. Bongart's old-world charm, theatrical manner, and artistic temperament complemented his artistic genius and helped to make him the center of a circle that included fascinating characters from the other arts. He always made friends easily, and some of Hollywood's most famous actors came to study with him and become collectors of his work. Late in his life, the actor James Cagney became a student and close friend of the Russian painter. The two made an extended grand tour of Europe together in 1963, one of the greatest experiences of the artist's life as Cagney's name opened doors to unique opportunities. After Cagney went home, Bongart ventured further south to the Middle East. In the 1970s, Bongart found another piece of paradise in Rexburg, Idaho, just outside of Idaho Falls, which has the majestic Teton Range as its backdrop. He purchased a 20-acre parcel of land where he had a main house and cabins for artists to use. 
In Idaho, he began to teach popular summer workshops where students could paint landscapes or work on open-air still lifes under the master's critical gaze. The most popular aspect of the summer sessions was the opportunity to watch Bongard, ever the showman, paint whether it was a summer still life with a watermelon, a floral with a lilacs, so beloved by Russian painters, or one of his bold landscapes. We should never forget that the best teachers are really actors, and indeed Bongart was a dramatic demonstrator who painted as if he was a fencer, stepping lightly backward and forward while he applied paint in bold, slashing strokes, while delivering a steady narration on life and the art world, peppering his speech with classic Sergeyisms. These summer classes, with their emphasis on painting directly from nature, were a major factor in the revival of plein air painting in the western United States that has occurred over the past 25 years. In his later years, Bogart began working on the type of western pictures that he had always wanted to paint. He produced large works of the southwestern landscape with its Native American inhabitants. He won a gold medal at the Cowboy Hall of Fame's famous Prix de West in 1982, a large annual exhibition put on by the National Academy of Western Artists, an organization made up of the finest western and landscape painters and sculptors. In the last months of his life, Bongart married Patricia Legrand, a painter and one of his students. When he died in 1985, the Russian painter was still at the height of his artistic powers and popularity. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the tour. And hey, if you like the channel, please subscribe today. And as always, thanks for watching.